yourself briefly. So Terry, I'm going to start with you. Excellent. Uh, so hello. Thank you. Uh, it's nice to meet you all. So I, my name is Terry McMahon, graduated in 93 uh, with a Bachelor of Accountancy. And Terry, tell us where you work. Oh, and uh, what, so right what, now, uh, Morgan Stanley uh, in the Private Wealth Management Group. Thank you so much. And Cheryl, how about you? Hi, my name is Cheryl LaMonica. And during my academic career, I did teach at Bentley, uh, corporate finance and accounting. Um, I'm currently at um, State Street in the credit risk group after finishing an S um, Harvard Business School executive ed program. Nice to be here. And thank you, Cheryl. And I'm going to ask Michael to share just a brief introduction of himself. Yeah, thank you, Alja. Uh, my name is Michael Lin. Uh, I graduated from Bentley in 2010. I uh, couldn't believe it has um, uh, been 11 years. Uh, I spent most of my career in Boston Scientific in their uh, corporate finance group. And uh, I changed jobs last year and I'm now senior finance manager for uh, at Belgian and their corporate finance team as well. Uh, really glad to be here and uh, to share my stories and answer any questions you might have. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. And you know what I forgot during that introduction? I forgot to ask you guys, the three of you, to share your fun facts. You know, students are always interested to know a little bit more about you than just the formal pieces of it. Um, so in as you're sharing um, on this next question, I'm hoping that, Terry, I'm going to start with you again, that you can describe what you do currently. What does your role and what's the day in the life as a Morgan Stanley Senior Vice President and Financial Advisor at, at, at Morgan Stanley? Okay. So I know we're going to get into our background. So first, I'll start with my story, if that's all right. Um, and because yeah, it relates sure. to Bentley. Um, I grew up uh, dancing. I grew up in Worcester and I grew up doing a lot of dance. And there is a video in the backstage of Bentley because I used to audition for boy bands of uh, me doing Vanilla Ice lip sync. So it is in <laughs> Bentley's archive somewhere. Um, so as far as now, so my background, uh, we're gonna, I know we'll get into that, but I focus really financial planning, estate planning, tax planning, investment planning. Um, anything related to, to this morning, I was looking at leasing a plane versus buying a plane for a client. Um, tomorrow, I have a big tax meeting with the CPAs to do tax loss harvesting and everything else. So, you know, it's pretty much anything financial related. Mm -hmm. and, and can you tell us a little bit more then, Terry, about your clients that you work for? Because the plane sounded really interesting. So it sounds like they're pretty high net worth. Yeah, so our team, uh, we have seven people on the team. There's three partners. Uh, we advise on probably eight, $8.1 billion. Um, it is uh, $10 million and above is kind of what the private wealth management target rate is. Um, and so it's really more sophisticated option planning, um, estate planning. Our backgrounds are a little bit different. My, one of my business partners uh, has a law degree. He ran the private wealth management estate planning group at Morgan Stanley. And the other one has been in business for 40 years. I uh, was a partner at Alex Brown before we moved to Deutsche Bank and then on to here. So yeah. mm -hmm. thank you, Terry, for that. Um, and I'll move to Cheryl again, if Cheryl can share just a little bit about what does a ABP of global credit review do? And don't forget your fun fact. Uh, yeah. So um, I just started the job in August. I'm still kind of learning. But uh, basically, we look at um, corporate credit risk at State Street. So we're looking at um, apartments that run like commercial real estate, leverage loans, alternative funds, um, BFX department. Um, I doesn't have my list here. Munis, um, and sovereigns, and financial institutions. Um, we look a lot also at credit risk of our, all of our counterparties. Um, so basically looking at, you know, the whole, um, the whole bank, um, very targeting just where the credit risk might lie within State Street. Um, they're trying to make this about, I think, seven people on the team. So it's a small team. So it's nice. Um, especially when you're starting a new job, you can get to know your team pretty well. Um, and that's about it. Fun fact, um, fun fact, um, come from a very athletic family. I was an All-American swimmer in several events in college. My older brother was a U.S. Olympic finalist um, and, well, trials. No, he didn't get the team, though. Um, and All-American swimmer, both in high school and college. My older brother, my younger brother, was an All-American football player at Notre Dame. Um, was drafted number five in the draft, NFL draft. He played for the Rams. 
And he won the Super Bowl against the Titans. What? <laughs> <laughs> that was definitely a good question of mine to ask you your yeah. fun fact. And it's so interesting, Terry, the dancer. You know, then we have, I know that you play an instrument, Cheryl, and so all athletes and swimmer and so forth. So, Michael, what are you going to say to that? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of hard to follow on, on that, especially <laughs> after what <laughs> Professor Monica said. Um, my, I'll start with my fun fact uh, because that has been a bit overwhelming because uh, I became a father uh, recently in March. And uh, so I have a newborn now six months, uh, six months at home and to take care of. It has been a, uh, a tough job, but a really rewarding job as well. <laughs> uh, I was joking that's asked me probably in two years and how I feel about it, because right now it's just survival mode every day just to trying to survive. Um, yeah, two years from now, Michael, you might have three children. <laughs> probably that involves twins, I hope. Otherwise, it's kind of hard to fit in. <laughs> so the quick math. Uh, okay, that's yeah, that's do. right. That's right. Um, yeah, that's right. You do. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my my story is I came to the U.S. from China um, in 2008. Uh, I came for grad school, and my major is actually in accounting. Um, and my undergraduate major is in finance. And right after I graduated from Bentley, I joined Boston Scientific in their um, finance leadership de development program. I kind of throughout my 10 years over at Boston Scientific, I worked on very uh, different areas of finance that included uh, internal audit, uh, uh, a financial planning analysis in corporate, in supply chain, in functions. And last year, I changed job. Um, I, jo I joined Biogen um, and in their corporate p a group. Um, so, so if you have any questions on corporate finance, uh, uh, I'd be happy to answer that. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Michael. And I know there are definitely people on this um, in this Zoom meeting who are so interested in corporate finance. So I'm sure more questions to come. But um, kind of continuing on this journey about careers, um, and I, I know some of you have addressed a bit of it, but again, I'll go back to Terry. I'm not going to switch it up just yet. Um, but just, just to ask you a little bit more about your path, how you actually chose finance. I know that you had mentioned earlier that you were in the finance club, you were in the investment club. How did you know that finance was what you wanted to do? And how did you, and it seems to me, looking at your LinkedIn profile, that it was somewhat of a direct path. Some people have a direct path. Other people have, you know, me, more meander or try to, you know, have a lot more uh, curves in the road, if you will. So can you share with us a little bit of your path and who and what helped you along the way? Yeah, um, and that's a great, I, I've been blessed with a lot of great mentors. Um, so I, from when I was little, I used to always look at the, the box scores of the Red Sox game and used to memorize, okay, if they get one hit out of the next three at bats, what's their percentage gonna be? So that's really what I used to do growing up. That's how I analyzed baseball. Um, but when I came out, I actually studied accounting, uh, went Deloitte and Touche, uh, did the CPA route. My mentor there uh, left to go to a family office. He was a director in the tax department at which I was working in. He went to the uh, family office. I then went over there uh, and became the chief investment officer at a family office. So I then got my CFA and CFP when I was there. Um, when he retired, uh, Deutsche Bank hired me to be the technical liaison between trading desks. So it was more constant learning. So I was covering Boston, New York, and Greenwich. I was doing option planning, tax planning, estate planning, everything. So I really get to learn a lot of different things. And that's what I always strive for, to be at a place where I'm just going to constantly learn. Um, and I started working with one advisor my for, for a lot of the time when I was at Alex Brown Deutsche Bank. And he asked me to join his team full time. So he's been my mentor, like my big brother, for probably the last 15 years I've been working with him. So I've been very lucky to come across people that have given me an opportunity and pushed me um, to learn more. So it's great. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, Terry, if I could ask a little bit further, it's it sounds like the way you describe it that is that people found you. But did you do did you did you reach out proactively to people to these people to literally mentor you, or did it just kind of happen? Yeah, uh, very lucky that they, uh, with Deloitte, you actually work on teams. So my manager, um, I'm the type of person that I, I grew up with a chip on my shoulder thinking, okay, everyone's smarter than I am. So I got to work harder than everybody. 
Mm-hmm. And that caused me to work harder, work longer. And so when you're working for managers that see you put in the extra effort, um, they tend to take you under their wing and a lot of times. I mean, there's some others that don't, um, but I was very fortunate that those did uh, help me on a, a good path. Yep. Okay. And thank you so much, Terry. And I'll move on to Cheryl for her thoughts on who and what helped you along the way. And I know your path is a little bit more colorful. Um, so feel free to highlight whatever you'd like. Yeah, I've had a um, very different path. And I think um, a lot of women have different paths because we, unfortunately, we are, or fortunately, <laughs> we are the primary caregivers if we have children or, you know, looking after um, parents. So it was very, very different. Um, I took a business course, business administration course at the U of R. First I started as a um, science, I was thinking pre-med. But um, that got a little hard to do because, um, you know, labs were really long into the afternoon. And I, you know, I was always running from lab to swim practice and stuff. So, you know, I didn't really, I, I enjoyed it, but it was just a lot of times in labs. I just didn't have the time for that because I wanted to pursue other things. Um, so I took a course, um, business administration course, I guess 101, whatever. And I loved it, fell in love with it, um, the courses. And so I decided to do that. Um, someone very influential in my life was my grandfather. He passed away this year at 102. He was a successful wow. um, real estate developer in Harlem, New York. Um, just was really phenomenal and just building up the Harlem community um, was in planning and getting a lot of things done for Harlem, helping a lot of people and introduced me to um, banking. And I would always tag along with him to you know board meetings, um, different um, business clubs like the New York Partnership he would let me just come and sit and I would just, you know, sit and listen to what was going on. So got to meet a lot of people, um, very successful people in the New York um, business community. Um, really enjoyed that. You know, finished from the University of Rochester, jumped into my banking career, became, I call myself a banquette, went to Manny Hannig, <laughs> did the retail training program, then was the system analyst. Then from there, I said, okay, well, it's now, we got to jump, take a jump. So I went um, back to school at Pace and got my MBA in finance. Um, had a great summer getting a corporate um, internship at Sister Dijon or how working for the World Banking Group. Um, and that was a lot of fun uh, working with the FEMAT and they were just opening up the futures market um, at the Paris Bourse um, and doing a lot of credit analysis in their World Banking Group, which I really enjoyed. So it was great spending the summer in Paris. I um, would have liked to stay there longer, but I had to finish. I had one more semester to go, but I was could have stayed there for a year, but I had one more semester to go. So I just stayed there for the summer for four months. And that was beautiful. Um, working and living in Paris. Um, still pinch myself because it was one of the best experiences of my life. Um, then from there, I segued to Chemical Bank. And I was in the um, credit trading program for the World Banking Group for Middle East, Europe, and Africa. Did that. Then there was a lot of finish the trading, but a lot of reorg. Then I jumped to the OCC, the Control of the Currency. And that was a really big jam because I was going from working for a big money center bank, going to working for a regulatory agency. But my experience at the OCC was really good because it basically gave you a whole really global or unique perspective of bank. You're looking at regional banks, money center banks, what we call them SIFI banks now, um, and small community banks. You really learn um, you know, how to run a bank. So I, like that. I did that in New York City and in Los Angeles. Um, and from there, I went to Europe. My husband is um, Italian and he got a job with Merck. So I had a big jump in moving to Europe. And then I had, I kind of hit a wall there because I had to figure out how to get a job. I didn't have my European passport, my Italian passport yet. So I, then I went into teaching. So I did some corporate teaching, teaching course finance and, um, finance and accounting courses to executives at Telecom Italia and large Italian banks, and then waited to learn the language, and then finally got an opportunity to work at Telecom Italia, where I was a marketing manager with the North American group. Um, they sent me to, I was in New York City for two years, and well, my husband back in Rome, but it was okay because he was coming back and forth, because um, he was um, had a lot of meetings in New, New Jersey, so it was easy. So it was easy for me because I'm going back to New York, my home, so I mean, I loved it, it was great. And we didn't have kids at the time, so it worked out well. 
So then I did that. And then we started my family. I had to kind of scale back because my husband traveled a lot. So I had to, so I left Telecom Italia and did some consulting work for a small U.S. telecom carrier, did some consulting. And then from there, I went back to teaching. And that was, I was able to do that basically to, um, you know, have both responsibilities of, you know, working and then taking care of the kids. I had to have a job that was very flexible and then be able to pick up the kids around three or four from school. So it was very difficult in Rome to have a corporate job with that kind of um, flexibility. So basically during my life, I've had to take several pivots depending on that work-life family balance. So mm -hmm. very different careers. A different career, but again, it sounds like a very um, fulfilling one. Um, and just to, to say that we each, each situation leads to the next one and it brings you to where you are today. And um, so I really appreciate you sharing that. Yeah, Cheryl. and at the academic, I, you know, I said, I said, let me get back to the corporate. So then I did this exec ed program at Harvard Business School. I was able to jump back and pivot back into the asset management industry. So I think you really have to, you can't really plan your life, you know, you have to be ready for the opportunities when they present themselves and put yourself in the position to accept those opportunities, but just be ready for them and just, um, you know, try to network, 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 because you never know who that connection you're going to have, no matter it could be in your church, could be at the bowling alley, could be at, you know, one of your kids' soccer games. I mean, you just, at the grocery store, you never know when you can make that connection where you're going to see an opportunity where you would like to go. So just always remember that. Thank you, Cheryl. I love all of that. Talk about network, network, network for development. <laughs> we are always about meeting and building relationships. So on that note, Michael, what do you have to say about networking and answering this question? <laughs> yeah. Um, so for me, maybe I would just start with, because my career path has been relatively straightforward so far. Um, Given that it's only been 11 years, uh, I spent 10 years <laughs> at, at, my, uh, at Boston Scientific. That's the company that I worked for after Bentley. And honestly, I think your question was also on why kind of uh, you know that you wanted to do corporate finance or, or what you do, finance. Uh, for me, it's more of a kind of grab what you can versus you, you can choose. It's not like you have a menu and you pick what you want. Because uh, I... When I was looking for a job at Bentley, that was during 2009, 2010, right after the financial crisis. Um, so it was really, really difficult to find anything that is available. Um, and honestly speaking, because even though that my undergraduate degree is in finance, my graduate degree in Bentley is actually accounting. So when I was at Bentley, my goal was always targeting at big four companies. If you ask anyone from the accounting program in Bentley, that would be their top choice. And there are four of them, right? So you get more <laughs> chances. Um, but I've been building towards that. But in the end, I didn't get in, get in any of the top uh, um, big four companies. Uh, and then it ended up getting into corporate finance, which I actually I like it even better. <laughs> Honestly, thinking back, I might not be enjoying that much uh, if I do public accounting, even though I got my CPA, I got my CFA. Uh, Terry here is a fellow CFA. You, you know what I mean? Because, you know, <laughs> <It's a cult. laughs> um, and also the IPNA. So I kind of did everything, but then I still figure out um, I do like what I do now, even though that's a little bit of a luck, kind of how I end up in corporate finance. Uh, they do have this uh, rotation program where you can choose where you want to go and what, what you want to do for the first two years of the program. But after the first two years, your career is just you decide where you wanted to do and where you want to go. And also even within the company, I did several different roles uh, that involved um, in different areas of corporate finance. Even within corporate finance, there's many different groups that you can do and many different functions and you might find them very different to your taste. You can like one, but really hate the other. Uh, you still can choose where you want it to do. And through the years, you kind of figure out, okay, I like this uh, IPNA better, so I, I just stayed within IPNA. Even after I, uh, I switched job last year, I'm still in corporate finance, uh, corporate IPNA group doing IPNA work. Um, but honestly, it's, it is, I think the global pandemic given has been really unique challenge to people's career paths because uh, 
it has been a year, over a year now, I have only been to the office once and I still haven't met my direct manager yet. So <laughs> <laughs> it is difficult to say that uh, how I'm fitting in or whether that's a good decision because whenever you leave a company after 10 years, it is a very difficult decision. I'm still not quite sure if I made, I made the right call yet. I'm being very honest, uh, very <laughs> kind of open on that. But uh, to Cheryl, Cheryl's point, it, it doesn't matter if that's not necessarily what you wanted to do. It's, it's part of the journey. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm confident that I can, I can go somewhere else if this is not ultimate uh, kind of dream job that I have. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of something that I can share with everybody. Just don't be afraid to make a choice. It does, it's, it's not a one-stop shop. You can still go from here to, you know, the still kind of your destination you can choose. Could end up being somewhere that you really like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I still like, like what I'm doing now. It's just uh, I'm not quite sure <laughs> because I haven't been to the office. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully we'll be able to connect and stay connected so you can share when you do finally meet somebody that you love it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so, Michael, it sounds to me like, um, again, I know you went the a little bit more traditional route. You went the, you know, finance development program, et cetera. Um, I, I guess my question is with regards to, you know, the challenge in your work. Do you really, again, what are some of the things that you really find challenging that you really enjoy about um, corporate uh, fp &A? Uh, yeah, I think first of all, I guess, because I know there's one of the topics that is specifically about international students. Mm -hmm. As an international student myself, I think the biggest challenge is not really work, is, is really kind of day-to-day -day communication and also that kind of the, the culture-wise, you know, how to fit in. I know we have time at school that really provided you uh, a safe environment. You can interact with people. You can learn how to communicate. But it's, it's so different when you really enter the, 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 the corporate world, world because at school, sometimes I don't really, I don't really talk that much <laughs> because, uh, it, but in, in meetings, you know, uh, you have to constantly talk in, in presentations and also you kind of wanted to uh, network and build your relationship even within the same company. Networking is very important because rarely you will see someone stay in the job, uh, the same job for like 10 plus years you will still have the opportunity if voluntarily or involuntarily kind of have to move to something else, even, you don't, if, you, even if you don't change companies. Uh, that's, it will be important that you network with other departments, other teams uh, to be able to know, make your next step. So the challenge for me is really through the, the first two years to, to, to be, get, adjust to the day-to-day uh, the -day and be able to up for the task. I remember a really awkward story that um, I struggled to leave a voicemail when I first started working. I had to redo it 10 times before I can finish the whole sentence. Um, and uh, I avoided that person because <laughs> after that, because I realized when you, even when you hang up, the voicemail will still be recorded. So I had to hang up a couple of times before I can record a full message. So the, uh, I think the next day I saw that person came, uh, you know, in the hallway. I actually avoided him because <laughs> I don't wanted to answer the question. Hey, what happened to the ten unfinished voicemail that you left me? Uh, so that's a, a kind of funny story, although it's pretty awkward. Honestly, believe, believe me, kind of this how challenging it was uh, for an international student whose native language is not English to try to really be be able to um, overcome that barrier. Uh, and, and started to really build the trust uh, among your employee, among your coworkers, among your other t leaders of the teams, so that they, when there's another job come up, come up in their team, they were thinking of uh, you, and you, you, they will view uh, you as um, a fearable candidate. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you, Michael. Um, and again, I do appreciate you sharing about, because uh, I do think there are a number of international students on this call, uh, on, in this meeting. So I do appreciate that, um, that perspective. But um, switching gears, uh, I know that a lot of students here are always interested to hear from professionals in the field who have been successful about some of the tips and advice to preparing for this finance job search. You know, so, and again, I'm going to ask the students, uh, feel free. I, I have a number of questions. I can certainly continue going on. But if there's anything specific that you want to ask, please feel free to put it in the chat 
or um, after this question, maybe I'll just open it up for, for you to share your thoughts. So just, you know, um, be prepared for that. But I did want to, you know, again, ask that question of you all. What, and I'll start with Terry, you know, what advice that you might have for students who are interested to access, say, a Morgan Stanley or finance careers in general? Is there any specific information that you would share with them to help them to prepare and be ready? Uh, that's a good question. So I think the networking part, I was never really good at networking, but I think it's um, it's so important, like Cheryl and Michael said, the to talk to, to reach out to an alumni. I get LinkedIn emails from people all the time from Bentley just saying, hey, is there anybody hiring? I don't know if there's anybody hiring, but him, that person reaching out to me the other day, I'll forward their resume on if it's a good resume and they, they seem respectful. And, you know, I wrote down a, a couple things that not as part as a job search, but post the job search, things that stand out to me when after I meet somebody, if I'm interviewing them or whatever, please send thank you letters and handwritten letters make a big difference. An email saying, thanks for the time. It's very nice. You definitely should follow up. But if you can get their address, sending them a handwritten letter is great. Um, the networking part is huge. And then uh, what else did I have? I wrote down. Um, oh, understand what you're going for. My daughter is going for an internship in investment banking. She didn't want me to help her at all. So she's going to a different bank. And she, she was like, okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to talk about this. So you don't even know what the job is about. Let's sit down, look at the website, understand what you're going for, understand the position. So really be prepared walking in there. What you're actually interviewing for, I think is really important. But I think the networking part is huge and should not be overlooked because there's a lot of people like us that are on this call that are going to want to give back because we've had people give back to us. So I'm happy to help anybody I can. Thank you, Terry. And on that note, how should students get in touch with you? Should they just connect with you on LinkedIn since we're talking about networking? And what do you think? Yeah, whatever. So the last couple of things I've been on, I know they've reached out to the host and said, can I get Terry's email, phone number, whatever. It really doesn't matter to me. Um, I may not get back to you the same day if I'm in the middle of a meeting, whatever, but I will definitely get back to you by the next day. Um, and it's that, or you can reach out on LinkedIn, LinkedIn. You can look at who my, can, I think a lot of uh, students, maybe, I don't know, maybe 10 have actually, whatever you call it, I don't even know, friended me on LinkedIn or <laughs> connected to me. Connected, whatever it's yeah. Called, connected. <laughs> So if connected on, you want to see my network, you know, whatever, that's fine. So whatever you feel comfortable with. Thank you, Terry. And Cheryl, what do you think of, about that question? What kind of advice? And again, especially because you've pivoted quite a bit and um, what advice do you have for students? Yeah, I would think to um, get to know your professors really well. Um, I remember when I was a graduate fellow at Pace, um, for the um, chairman of the finance department, I would have calls, you know, from recruiters and people looking for um, students that were graduating soon for finance roles. Um, one time, just by mistake, I was like, talking to an accounting professor who had lived in Italy. So we had like a chat for about an hour, really great chat. And then the next day I had, you know, five CPA firms calling me about jobs. So you just never know, you know, just meeting someone and talking to someone. You have to tell, most important thing where you have to tell people what you want, what type of job you're looking for. And if you don't know, you need to go back because if people don't know what you want or what you're looking for, they're not going to be able to help you. So you have to be very, very clear on what type of job you want. And also it's a good thing to figure out what, what type of culture, corporate culture you would like to work in because corporate culture is very diverse. For example, we're having a merger, say you just bought um, Brown Brothers and Harriman, right? That's mm -hmm. a very different culture from State Street, right? So now they're going to have this integration. It's going to take over a three-year process. And they're going to have to try to merge these two very different cultures together. Yes, they're still in asset management, but BBH is, you know, a very, you know, kind of old school, old world um, culture where, you know, employees may stay their whole career and never, and never leave. So um, it's very important to figure out what you want to do, what industry you like to work in, and where do you think you would be fit most or be most comfortable in the corporate culture? Because if you're not comfortable in the corporate culture, it's gonna be a disaster. So I think that a lot of times students don't understand that. They just take a job just to get any job. And they don't think about the culture and the culture is very important, I think. Mm -hmm. And Cheryl, I will agree with you on that note. There's so many times when students even meet with, we as um, graduate career development coaches and they just say, you know, 
I just want that financial analyst job, or I just want, but they don't, but they don't have a, a better sense of, of where, um, and, or, or, or again, why? maybe, maybe, maybe they don't know what, right. maybe right. they just say, I want any, any job, you yeah. know, so it's really important. I, I think that that advice is a uh, key um, to having people be able to help you. You know, mm-hmm. if you say that you want to be in this industry or these kinds of companies, people will remember you for that as opposed to if you just say, I'll work anywhere. Right. 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 Uh, so thanks for that. And how about you, Michael? Any other additional advice that you have to add to what Terry and Cheryl said or piggyback? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, for me, I have a sort of a theory or a philosophy or system that I have for job searching um, because I believe job searching is a unique project where the result is so important. And a lot of times people really forgot what you need to do right is all in the process. Um, just to, because a lot of people are so results are oriented when it comes to job searching, because you, I would just wanted to get a job. The, the, the result and the end goal is so big and sometimes overshadows kind of what you need to do. Because lots of people would uh, be wondering why I didn't get any interviews it probably because you, your resume needs to be, uh, you know, critiqued and you need to work on your resume. And, um, and if you got enough interviews, but you get, don't get to the second round, it's probably something that you didn't do right for interviews and you need to practice your interview skills. And I know that career services offer a lot of uh, mock interview sessions, you know, resume critique sessions. You need to leverage those and don't just uh, focus too much about, oh, I want to get into that company. But do, do not forget, you need to get things done right before you can get the job. You need to get two, at least two or three rounds of interviews uh, done uh, perfectly. You need to your resume uh, to be to be great to be able to get to the interview option. And and the important thing is along the way, your chance of success increases. That means if, if you do everything right before, and your chance of getting a job can only get bigger uh, because you know maybe out of a hundred resumes. 10 people get in, get interviews, um, that's 10% of chance. And then out of 10 people, you get first round, maybe only five, they get into the second round, that's 50% chance already. And out of the five, and maybe just the one, or maybe if they hire more positions, you know, one or more people will get the job. So each step, your chance of success really increases. And the f- further you go, the, the, you know, the, um, obviously the more likely you'll get the job. And then, and this is a very simple theory, but I have to say that um, because I've been there, <laughs> I've been I'm part of the, that, that I really overlooks the importance uh, of getting those every little steps right. Um, I remember that I, I came to uh, talk to Alja all the time, just making sure that I'm on the right track now and then, because I'm very confident that if I do everything just right and I'm on the right track, this train will take me to the final destination is to get a job even though that I do not know really which company will be able to offer me a job, but I know that I will be, I'll be getting one because I'm on that train and it will take me there. Um, mm-hmm. So because I say that is because um, a lot of uh, times the psych- uh, psychologically, you know, it's is a challenge to be able to, to, to go through this process. Uh, all of the uncertainty and anxiety is hard to deal with. Um, but if you know that you're doing everything right, Every every steps are according to plan. You you can feel um, a lot more at ease uh, on a daily basis. Uh, the the second the last thing about networking is again don't be so result oriented when you do networking. I think it's it, either Terry or Cheryl mentioned that you do not know which one will lead to the a really job opportunity or offer. So don't be so result oriented and thinking that I need to get something out of this conversation. A lot of times, all you can get is just uh, feeling good about yourself and have, you're just happy you had a good conversation. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's enough. And a lot of times, just you have to force yourself to go, go to those events. Uh, I have feel the same way. A lot of times, there's many events that are posted, um, hosted by either uh, the Graduate Financial Association or Career Services that I just feel like, oh, it's another event. Do I really want to go? I, I don't really want to go. I just want to stay at home and eat pizza. <laughs> but then you just force yourself to go and uh, end up, you know, finding something really helpful and useful. You know, just uh, you kind of have to force yourself to go through that, do everything right, and the rest just give it all to destiny. Uh, I truly believe that if you do everything right, 
uh, the result will be good. Thank you, Michael. Yes, and I think everybody is trying to do the best that they can and, and hope to get that great opportunity after graduate school. And, and I, I will say as um, an advisor for Michael at the time, he with Boston Scientific, I don't know if I don't know the exact stats, but he actually went through that process where he was one of like, I don't know, hundreds of, of applicants in the beginning. And then again, was end, ended up being like one of 20 and then ended up being one of six. And um, so, yeah, I think he, he, he's saying what he's experienced. So, you know, thank you for that. Um, I did, as I said, uh, wanted to open it up to you all um, to see if you had any questions at this point in time. We've been having a nice conversation getting to know Terry, Cheryl, and Michael, a little bit about their backgrounds, um, a little bit about what they do. They've talked a lot about finding opportunities. Um, there's certainly more that I could ask, and Smriti, I know you had some questions earlier, so um, not sure if, uh, you, if you do have a question, if you want to yeah. just unmute and and yeah. offer it and it sounds like Smriti wants to start <laughs> off. Yeah so I just had a quick question so what advice do you have for someone who is starting their career in FPNA roles? So sorry can you repeat one more time? Um, like like what advice do you have for someone someone who's starting their career in FPNA roles? Uh, yeah so I think this is more very specific so I uh, apologize to people who are not interested in FPNA but so financial planning analysis, uh, it is a lot about budgeting and forecasting and, 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 and analyze what happened. So if you have ever listened to investor calls about company release their earnings, uh, what they talk about is basically the job of FP&A. So they need to explain what happened in the quarter. Let's say uh, just a random example, Apple uh, released their earnings, their sales went up. 6%, they need to explain, oh, our sales is driven by iPhone 12 launch that really successful in China, just for example, and especially on emerging countries that really contributed to the growth. Um, and also, the, you know, things like that is the fp &A job will, will do. Um, and the, the advice is really, no matter wh uh, what company that you work for, you need to understand the business. As you can see, the example I gave, you need to understand what really happened behind the numbers. It's really a very basic job to present and prepare other reporting. It's another story to understand what it's showing to the uh, senior management. Uh, it is mm -hmm. super, super critical. The value is not you have a report produced. The value is can you tell me what happened and, and why the numbers look this way. It is difficult uh, to, to do that, uh, especially to do it well, because even with your explanation, uh, it's a different story to say, oh, we just have higher sales in China versus because of the iPhone 12 model is so, uh, with a new color that is so appealing to the younger generation. And that's why we, we, we are so successful. And also competitors launch is not. That's why we're seeing uh, sales growth is better than we expected. So the two comments are, you know, just uh, I made up, but you can see the difference that it, it, you can definitely have different quality on that. It's, uh, fp a is the job that really emphasizes on the quality versus the quantity. Um, and, uh, and also to get to that, you really need to understand the business. It's not easy because you, you, I work in life science and healthcare companies. That requires me to understand how the device works. In Boston Scientific, you need to understand the different type of stents and, and how it, you really compare with other uh, competitors. And in Biogen, you understand the different drugs and uh, mm -hmm. clinical trials. Um, so it's all very different. Uh, but learning the company is the key. And also, if you can really know the business well, you can definitely do well in FP&A. Thank you, Michael. I think it's it's a wonderful advice. So I just have a, I just have a follow up question. So uh, what do you think are the skills that are most important? I know I have fp &A related questions because I'm looking myself working in an fp &A role. So just another question to you, Michael. So what do you think are the skills that are most important for fp &A? And then I will say um, that I would like to ask um, Terry and Cheryl to chime in when it comes to your specific organizations, your those areas of private wealth management and uh, global credit. Uh, so, Michael. Yeah, I can be really quick. I think the most um, important, I think, for any row is just uh, you always know the foundation well. That means that you have to be very solid in your finance basic knowledges. 
you know uh, accounting well as well because even though it's app a you still don't know accounting um and then uh, the next step was always have a big picture in your head trying to understand um you know why you're doing this um you know, just not just not just mind, mindlessly doing it but understand why and, and terry what are your thoughts I just want to go back one thing, what Michael said. Michael said, um, when you go through an interview, uh, you know, try to leave your impression, even if it doesn't work out. So I did not get a job at a big four accounting firm, but big six when I was there, that's how old I am, but a big six accounting firm. The first time I interviewed, two months later, they called me back out of the blue because the interview went well. I just wasn't one of the top candidates, but I left an impression on them during the interview. So do take that process really seriously because I, I was devastated I didn't get it, but then they came back. Um, and I think, you know, the other point Michael made is on anything we do, you always ask why. You have to understand the why. You cannot just execute because I've been caught off guard early in my career. Like, well, that's what they told me to do or that's what somebody did before me. That, that doesn't work. And management or managers or your boss, whoever it's going to be, they need information to make better decisions. And if you just go through the motions, that doesn't help anybody. So I, I think it's a very consistent message in whatever field I was in. And Terry, in terms of um, Smriti's question, but um, not focused in FP&A, so those people that are just starting out um, yeah. in private wealth management or in your area of finance, what advice would you have for them? Yeah, no, that's, so it really is, sorry, I didn't really kind of bridge that, but I think it is constantly questioning the why. So when I'm given, when I started off in kind of an al financial analysis, it was do a cash flow statement. Okay, well, what does that really tell me? Are they getting financing? Is it investing activity? Is it normal operating leverage? Like I, you have to really understand the different parts of a balance sheet, uh, an income statement, um, and truly do understand what it's saying. So no matter what field you're in, it's, it's, definitely going to be the same thing. Um, and just work hard. Like people like, you'll actually be surprised. The harder you work, the more you learn. The more you learn, the more you impress people that hopefully will help you along in your career. Excellent. Excellent. Um, and Cheryl, how about for you? Um, yeah, it's just funny. When I was an academic, um, you know, teaching finance and accounting, I always try to te tell my students, well, you know, just don't tell me something went up, increased or decreased, you know, get behind the ratio, get behind the number, tell me what, and they go, oh my God, what do you want to know that for? Because so, these are the kind of discussions you're going to have when you get into the business world, you know, and you've you got to know it. Everyone can say that, you know, owner's equity increased or whatever, or sales went up 10%. Yeah, but why? What actually happened? You know, so, and I think right now, even with remote, I think one of the key things that will skill set that will make you successful is being an excellent communicator you have to know how to communicate well not only with your colleagues but you know middle management upper management you have to be able to communicate well and also you have to have good writing skills it's 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 crucial um and you have to be able to tell tell your story in an interview you have to be able to know who you are as a person and be able to articulate your story and leave and be able to leave an impression with people. Because as um, Terry was saying, you know, maybe you don't get the job right now, but six months or a year from now, they could call you up with even a better opportunity, you know, that you don't know about. So, you know, when you go into an interview, you know, do your best, um, try to make it as a conversation, not just and try to ask them questions too. So it's more of a conversation, not like you're being tested. Because those are the best interviews when they turn into a conversation and you're really having a good dialogue between you two. And even if something doesn't happen, you have no idea. That person, you can reach out to again three months from now and he may know another person in um, the same industry, but another firm that could have an opportunity for you. So really need to, um, I think, really focus on your communication skills and not only have the technical skills because the communication skills, it was what going to, it's what can, it's what's going to give you the job and what's going to, you know, help you develop your career, go into, you know, middle management and perhaps even senior management. You have to be able to communicate. Can I just say one thing on what Cheryl just said that's really important? So for me, um, when I first started, I would get defensive when somebody critiqued me or, you know, and I'd be like, no, I'm right. You know, and group think is much better than an individual thought, but, um, 
to listen to other people's opinions, it's really hard to do sometimes, especially when you think you're right. But I will guarantee you 50% of the time you walk away and say, hmm, that's a pretty good point. Maybe I should at least rethink my process. Even if I come out right eventually, I never thought about the angle they had. So I think that's a very good point on the communication part. Don't be defensive when you get critiqued because I've been critiqued plenty in my life. Wow, I think all three of you could be, you know, someday when you leave your finance professions, you should come to work for Bentley in career development. <laughs> you can all be great career coaches. Um, it okay. seems like Lynn has, Lynn has a question. So Lynn, I'm going to let you ask your own question because we're a small group. Go ahead. Hi, uh, so my question is for Terry. Uh, I'm interested in uh, the wealth management uh, industry, and I, I would like to ask like your advice like uh, on the key skill require or any uh, requisite certificate like required for graduate students just uh, growing from master degree and have uh, not much have uh, experience re relevant for the industry. Yeah, so it sounds like there's like a, a number of students here that might be interested in this field, but um, that don't have a lot of experience and wondering about the certificates that uh, might be helpful. And again, um, Terry, I just wanted to add that, you know, a lot of these students here are, they're all graduate finance students. Um, some of them are Master of Science in Finance and others are, are following this financial analytics track. So if there's anything that any of you could add with regards to that data and that analytics space and the necessity of it and how important it is now, uh, that would be also helpful to add to Lynn's question. No, that, that's great. And so when people think wealth management, and this is just my own, not saying you, any of you did this, but I always thought it was kind of a stockbroker. You go out, you pick stocks, you do all this kind of stuff. There's definitely two different parts of wealth management. So wealth management has that advisor role but it also has what they call a wealth strategies group, which it seems like finance majors would more gravitate towards. And that's what I did when I first came out of public accounting. So I would be the one sitting, uh, running models, um, explaining asset allocation, financial planning, um, forecasting, handing it off to an advisor and the advisor would present it to a client. So I did all kind of the nuts and bolts finance work. What did I need for that? Um, the CFA is extremely helpful but it real, if, if I had to think, what does a client know? What does the end user know? And why would they find me more valuable? Uh, and I think CFA is very, very hard to do. But I would say the CPA is most recognizable. Then the CFP probably, which was probably the, the easiest to do. And then the CFA, even though we all know the CFA is really hard, most end users don't really understand what that is. So those designations tend to help you with your employer. Um, and the things you need from like a series seven, series 24, all those um, advisor licenses, those will all be sponsored by the firm you go. So you don't have to worry about any of that stuff before you get there, they'll help you get the series seven. Um, but I would think a lot of people don't ask the question. And this is when people ask me, how do I approach Morgan Stanley about a job? Or I have an interview with them, what should I ask them? Ask them about the wealth strategies group if you really want to be in kind of behind the scenes, building the models for wealth management. And that was an invaluable lesson because I worked with all the brokers, all the advisors, the trading desks, and I get to formulate everything from that group. But it's kind of a hidden group nobody knows about, but every big bank will have it. I don't know if that answers the question, but. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, oh. that, that helps, thanks. Okay. Okay, does anybody else have any questions? Again, I know that we asked a lot of our- oh. I have a question. Oh, okay, so ha, huh. feel free. Hello. Yeah, so um, I'm not talking about the interview, but like uh, when I applying for some financial positions or internship program, they always ask me to do assessment, like a uh, behavioral assessment and also knowledge as assessment and do you have like any advices for student to go through those assessments because like for me I I did some and I found like they are not easy to go you know so Terry Cheryl Michael any thoughts on assessments and a question about that 
I can uh, personally, I would think that uh, the career services would probably be better because they're going to be more familiar with the broad uh, different types of personality tests. So I really don't have anything to add on it. I, we don't require those. So I'm sorry, I can't add anything. And Cheryl and Michael, it sounds to me like maybe you're the same as Terry. Yes, okay. I never, I have never done an assessment myself. So, are you talking about like questionnaires you have to fill out or behavioral interview questions? That no, were asked like during interview? yeah, right now I applying for a uh, an analysis uh, roles in Morgan Stanley, and they just sent me a invitation to do quant assessment today. <laughs> All right, then that one I can, I'll go, I'll find out what that's all about. So what is it, <laughs> what's it called? A quant, what? A quant assessment? Yes, quantitative okay. assessment. Okay. So on it, one, one quick thing that I just remembered is if you're ever, we've had kind of behavioral quite like putting you in those buckets. I forget the, um, always, always answer them as you're a team player and you will always <laughs> collaborate with everybody before making a decision. But yeah, those, that's it, my one. <laughs> it is small. It is just a small part of the assessment, but like it also include like probabilities and uh, like a computational knowledge check. Oh, okay. So yeah, it's like combined in a one sixty minutes test. Okay. Yeah, I'll ask uh, human resources what is the quantitative assessment, and then I'll I'll try to reach out to you guys and let you know what it was. I, I haven't heard of it, so uh, I'll yeah. let you know though. I I, I got a lot of like uh, when I applied to any uh, analysis positions, like ninety percent, uh, ninety percent of them I got invitation for assessments. Oh, mm -hmm. great! So it looks yeah. like that they're and, trying to. Yeah, I have to go through the assessment before I can think of the interview. You know. Yeah. 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 And, and again, there's so many types of assessments. So ha, like Terry said, if you'd like to speak a bit more about that, feel free to, to come in and um, we can certainly talk a bit more and do a little bit more research. Yeah. yeah I just want to say that um, behavioral interviews is basically when you ask a question and they want to see how you behave in a certain situation on the job. So there's not a yes or a no answer. They want to know, you know, what's your thought process. And again, as Michael was saying, are you a team player? You know, so they, they're trying to see, you know, okay, what drives this person? And how would this person, you know, react under a situation of stress, for example? You know, do we want this person to be on the team? So you have to be very, very thoughtful when you are answering questions like that. And sometimes in an interview, right, maybe they give you, they throw you a really strange question or a really hard question. You know, one of the tricks I use is like, oh, let me think about that. And so, and then go on to a different topic and then you can, you know, go on to an easier topic and then come back five minutes later and then have your thought process together and answer that question. You don't really have, you have to answer all the questions that are asked of you in the interview, but, you know, sometimes you can delay it a little bit and that, that works. And sometimes they forget about the question, then you don't have to answer it. <laughs> so, <laughs> it can work in your favor. Yeah, so uh, come on in and we can certainly talk more about um, or anybody, if there's a behavioral interview process, we have actually the good good thing is is that October is our mock interview month, um, so there are a number of mock interview opportunities available. And I will put forth a plug for Professor Wasserman's. Um, he is a uh, finance professor here at Bentley, and he does offer 45 minute one on ones twice a week. So feel free to sign up for those um, as soon as possible. Okay. And Audra, I just uh, want to yeah. add that I still remember so clearly the mock interview that I did um, with TGX. Uh, you remember that one? Mm -hmm, that, mm -hmm. I, I have to say that benefited so much. That really changed my whole perception of how I see interviews and the details that you need to pay attention to. So definitely take advantage of that. Because as I said, you just wanted to sharpen your tools. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, and so again, I am willing really interested to see what other students thank you so much to ha and lynn for sharing their questions if you have any other ones feel free to again put them in the chat or just again we are a nice small group so feel free to to um to ask chandrika or anu or um lynn johnny anybody have any other thoughts hogan i see you guys shall jean-philippe do you have any do you have any questions 
you, you've said so many good things, Terry, while they're, while they're thinking about it, what other words, sage words do you have? <laughs> <laughs> well, I just Googled, uh, so Morgan Stanley 2021 <laughs> candidate <laughs> assessment practice. So there's, if you Google Morgan Stanley 2021 candidate assessment practice tests, it actually gives you how to approach those tests. So I don't know, it, but there's like four pages of different things to consider. There's a practice test. So you may want to just Google that. But I'll, I'll yes. see if I can find anything else, too. Thank you so much. <laughs> I will have a lot. Yeah. And all I can say is that I do think that, that this interaction really is a show of why it's important for you to attend events like these, to meet people like Terry, to meet people like Cheryl, to meet real people like Michael, who care about you and are willing to help, um, despite, you know, not, not necessarily in this setting, maybe even afterwards. I don't mean to offer that of you all, but um, I feel like I've known Michael for many years and, and Cheryl, again, you've been a professor here, so I feel like you're, you're probably um, prone to helping students. <laughs> so if that's the case, I know Terry said that he um, was open to sharing his LinkedIn. Um, Cheryl, Michael, would that be the best way for people to reach out to you as well? Is that appropriate? Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. Didn't mean to put you on the spot, um, but put you on the spot. <laughs> um, anybody have any other um, words of advice that you might have, Terry, Cheryl, or Michael? I mean, I know we're approaching the three o'clock. I know Cheryl actually has to leave at 315. Um, so are there any other like final words of advice that you have while our students are, are thinking about other things that they might want to ask you? So maybe I'll start with Michael. Uh, thanks. Uh, I I think the last thing I wanted to say is really the, uh, you, I think finding a job, especially for international students, it's uh, a tough job to do itself. <laughs> so be strong, be mentally strong, and be really good with your plan and stick to it. Um, and again, to, to and the same topics of networking or uh, going through the process, really keep your expectations a bit low that would help level set your men's site because it's going to be tough to adjusting. You put your hopes up and then it didn't work out and then you have you will be feeling down a little bit, but you have to be find the strength uh, to go on and push on because it's not an a easy world right now uh, to, to find a job, uh, even though the market has been very great, uh, but still for international students, it has been always challenging. Um, so just really be strong and... Uh, Build a very well plan and execute. Um, I think that's very important to stick to your plan. And don't be uh, so result-oriented and thinking, I have to get something out of something. You need to do it and think about it, uh, the reward later. Just do it because it's a math game. There's a chance of um, probability of success in each step. Uh, if it's 1%, that means that if you do it 100 times, you're going to be at least succeed in one time. That's one, even 1%, one you can do it. You can get one success in 100 times. And you only need one success to get a job offer. So that's very simple. Even if you only had 1% chance, it only means that you have to go through 100, 100 times. That's very easy. You know, and that reminds me, Michael, just of a quick silly story of a friend of mine who was looking to find somebody to marry. <laughs> She was an analytics person, and she actually employed the same strategy that you just said. And she met with like 50 people or and whatnot. Number 41 ended up being the one she married. <laughs> yeah, that's how prob probability works. <laughs> just apply that. It's a simple math game. Uh, just um, level set, you know, uh, just do it. <laughs> so, yes, this, this strategy applies to life. Etc. So on that note, who's going to top that? Terry, Cheryl? Actually, I'll, I'll leave it to Cheryl because I know you have to leave at 315. Well, I don't know if I can top that. Um, <laughs> I just think that, you know, you should, you know, be positive and, you know, you have to network. Um, and also when you're networking, you know, try to give something back to someone who helps you. Don't just try, just don't take, you know. So if someone gives you like a really good contact, a really good lead, maybe you can, you know, um, share an article with them or share an outing. Maybe you, maybe you both, for example, maybe you both like jazz 
it begins to, you know, invite them to a concert or just saying, you know, there's this jazz concert, you know, give them information about something that they're interested in. So always take it as a give and take. Um, remember, it took me a while to find a corporate job in Boston. So in the meantime, you know, I was trying to figure out, okay, now where do I want to be in financial services? So, you know, I met with people at the Fed, at State Street, at Wellington, and a couple other smaller asset management firms trying to figure out exactly what, where would I be the good corporate fit? Where would be the good corporate fit for, for me? So that really helped in a sense. And when I found a job at State Street, you know, I already have a, a really good network of middle management and senior management that I have known for the past, I say, three to four years. So, you know, now that I'm there, you know, I have that network and the resources to go to if I need help or to get information. So, you know, it's really important to, you know, people that have helped you along the way with either really good introductions to stay in touch with them and let them know how you're doing. Because a lot of people, you know, you get the contact or you get the, um, the referral and then you, the person gets a job and then you don't, you know, hear from them again, you know, and that, that doesn't look too good. So always, you know, keep your um, networks warm and, um, you know, try and stay in touch, right? Because the world is very small and it all, everything comes in full circle. You never know who's going up. As I learned to many hand, they said, do not be mean to anyone. Do not say anything <laughs> bad about anyone because you never know which executives are going up or which are coming down. <laughs> so, you know, just uh, try to be positive. And if you, especially if you have nothing good to say about someone, just say the person is a nice guy or a nice gal and leave it at that. You know, don't bad mouth people because that's not going to be helpful either to you or to that person. Mm -hmm. And that's about it. <laughs> Yeah, and Cheryl, just really, really quickly, um, I'm not sure if you mentioned your story about landing at State Street. Um, I, know, I think you said that you ended up there, but is there a special story that you can share? Was it networking related? Did you land it through networking? Yeah, it was very, very strategic networking. And so each person that I talked to gave me another good lead. And then I finally found um, um, an HR executive who was from Austria, and we had a great conversation. We talked, he loved Italy, so then we went on that topic, had a really good conversation, and that led me to meeting with the senior vice president of the group that I'm working with. And then she sent me off to uh, meet with the managing director, who actually became my actual boss. So you just never know, you know, when everyone gives you another connection to talk with, don't say, oh my God, I got to talk to another person. <laughs> I, I had to talk to at least maybe 12 people to land to my job. So every connection was, it was, I was getting closer and closer and closer. And then a couple of weeks after I had that um, interview with that managing director, then I met with the EVP of another group. And then I had an interview for another job, but I, but I wanted to go with this MD's group. And then the MD reached out for me, out to me and said, well, hey, I have a position in my group. Are you interested? You know, of course I'm interested. And then I was able to get the job. So you just never know which connection or which interview and don't, you know, say, oh my God, this is a 20th person. Just keep talking because that means you're getting closer and closer. Yes, keep it going. I'm the positivity person. That's my number one strength. So optimism. <laughs> And just uh, resilience and patience, uh, again, it sounds like is uh, the, the mantra. And Terry, I think unless other students have questions, you have the final word, sir. <laughs> um, you know, mine is not, mine just basic things <laughs> that I've learned and live by. So it, it, this probably doesn't apply to any of you, but things that I've learned, um, I'm constantly learning because there's somebody always smarter than me in the room. Um, Listen to, open, listen to other opinions, be open-minded because you will make a better choice in the end, even if it confirms your belief. Be nice, it's not that hard, um, and give back to those that helped you. To Cheryl's point, somebody calls me, asks for a favor, I'll help them, but I won't be looking to help them again if they don't, if it's just always calling me to ask for a favor. Um, even if you call to say, hey, did you see the Red Sox last night? Something to show that you're not just interested in getting something from them is really important. Mm -hmm. And, and I'll, maybe I'll leave the last word to Smriti. Smriti, did you have any other thoughts? Or again, as students, feel free. So Smriti. I, I think I'm good for now. It was, it was good to hear from all of you. And yeah, I, I really enjoyed talking to each one of you today. Thank you so much for taking the time and speaking with all of us. Mm -hmm. And so I will echo that as well. So I think 
if we don't have any other questions, um, I want to thank each and every student. Um, Xiao, Hogan, Ning Tuan, Jean -Pierre, Lynn, John Drico, all of you, Michael, I like to name you all, Johnny, Lynn, I knew, and I'm not sure if I got that correctly, but thank you so much, Smriti, for coming today and listening and, and enjoying and learning from Terry McMahon of Morgan Stanley, Cheryl LaMonica of State Street, uh, Michael Lynn from Boston Scientific and Biogen. We are so appreciative of your time. We um, are inspired by your success uh, and the advice that you shared today. Um, please stay in touch. Uh, and again, if you need anything from Graduate Career Development or Bentley, just let me know. Have a good day, everyone. Good Thank, day, you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you.